Welcome to Punch Keys Podcast. I'm Poppy Minix, your co-host, bringing you blunt talk for the fiction novelist. And I'm Cass Kay, your other writerly co-host. If you love to ramble about writing and need a tribe, you found us. Are you ready? We're uncorking now. Let's talk about punching those keys. Poppy, it's that time. Hey, Cassandra. Ah, oh, it's time for Punch Keys. I hey. love Punch Keys time. Today is a really, really fun episode. I'm super excited. You guys probably know it's an interview because I'm always super excited when it's yes. an interview. It's yes. an interview! It Woo-hoo! is! Yes. We are super excited. Today we have with us Carla Hawk. She is the author of Fight Right. She's laughing at me. I'm pretty sure I pronounced her name wrong. Author of Fight Right through Writer's Digest. She actually has some classes that she offers through Writer's Digest. Guys, you'll have to find her after this, and I'll make sure to put, as with all people we interview, I'll put her web address and her social media contact within our episode description so you can find her. She is trained in, from my research, I found at least nine different styles of fight. It was insane. It's so impressive. And there's a bunch of stuff I want to go into specifically about her website, so I will wait Mm -hmm. to do that and say, welcome, Carla. Please tell me how how to say your name right. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. It's okay. It's Hoke. But what, why I'm <sighs> laughing is, for those of you who are listening, right before we came on, we, we laughed and talked about how different people pronounce my name. And I'm like, you know what? In the grand scheme of things, what does it really matter? And it, that's why I just started laughing. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get it right. <laughs> but you know what? Crash I think people actually have an easier time finding me if I say Hotch, because at least that sounds frenetic. <laughs> H-O-C-H. Hotch. <laughs> So, but yeah, it's pronounced Hoke. Perfect. So, welcome. I mentioned in the intro your website because we have Mm -hmm. to start out talking about your website. It's amazing. So, it's Fight Right. Obviously, right is W R I T E dot net. It's fabulous. One, she's three years in a row now. It's one for Writer's Digest, most useful website for writers. Oh, that's fantastic. Top 100 websites for writers. Yeah, yeah, I'm very thankful. If you go on this and look, her website is a plethora of information for you. And as a writer, like I said, there's classes of Writer's Digest, but she also does a podcast. She has video podcasts. What's the word for that? Video cast. I do some IGTV things every now and then. And I used to do, I have a YouTube channel that is greatly ignored because I just got overwhelmed. I was doing too many things and, you know, I was kind of like a jack of all trades, but a king of none. And so I really had to kind of prune things and say, okay, what's my focus here? You know, when I can get a video out, great. When I can't, I'm not going to beat myself up over it. So I've got some things on IGTV and yeah, Fight Right. If you do misspell Fight Right and put R-I-G-H-T, you'll still get to me. I own that too. Oh, nice. That's fantastic. So who designed your website and how much hands Ah, in that did you have? You know, about hmm, two years ago, I actually am also a Gold Crown Award winner through Christian Authors Network, CAN. And the first time that I have won for my brand, Thomas Umstadt, if guys, you don't know who he is, you need to look him up. He's amazing. He interviewed me and he said, Carla. And I said, Thomas, he goes, (laughs) you have a blogger address and I went yeah he goes that's not good he goes it's not fight right it's fight right dot blogger and I went is that bad he goes that's super bad he goes you got to quit this he goes you got to step up your game he goes you're you're real now you got to do this and I'm like okay <laughs> so a little over a year ago he suggested I go to Storm Hill Media S-T-O-R-M-H-I-L-L. And the great thing about Stormhill Media is they cater to writers. They know what writers are looking for. And so they have plugins that are specific to writers. I know my book table is one of them. So if you have a lot of different books, you can have them all listed on your site and they all go to wherever you know, the um, place of purchase is. But yeah, I've been real happy with Storm Hill Media because I am tech Amish. I seriously have zero tech ability. And when I say I have sat and cried trying to do things to my website, I'm, I'm dead serious. But Storm Hill Media has been really helpful to me and they uh, go through WordPress and it really is user if I can do changes. <laughs> Anybody can do changes. Okay. I'm like a one legged woman in a two legged race. I'm telling you. So uh, Storm Hill Media has been great. Tell them, I don't know, I don't, I don't necessarily have a code or anything, but if you tell them Carla, I don't know, put the code Carla or something, uh, maybe you'll. Maybe you'll get a discount. I don't know, like 10% or something like that. But give it a shot. It is yeah. worth trying. Yes. It is worth trying, yeah. So they, they've been really good for me. So I, the website became like a one-stop shop. 
So now it I is. can, you know, if you, the blog, the book, if you just need to get in touch with me to see. And, you know, I used to have a, a swag shop too. I used to have shirts and everything. And I've got to get back on that. But again, I was spreading myself too thin. And during COVID, the quarantine, I'm like, okay, I'm crazy. So something <laughs> has to give. And so uh, some of the things got left by the wayside. But yeah, I've been thankful. It's been a one-stop shop and much easier for me overall. You said you've pruned back and you've focused in on trying to be a king in some trades. Which things are you focusing on specifically right now? Blog, yeah. And that's something that that Thomas uh, did too. He also has a podcast and he talked about burnout. And I was hardcore in burnout. I I was talking to him and I said, you know, I'm tired. I just don't feel like I'm doing anything right. You know, my training is bad. My writing is crummy. Everything is just... And he goes, well, let's talk about what all you're doing. And I named all the things. He goes, there's your problem. He goes, you have burnout. And he actually, somewhere on his site, he has like a little questionnaire formula thing so you can see where your time is going and how to prune some of that back. I call it making a list of what loves you and then circling what loves you back. And there were some things that just weren't, you know, YouTube wasn't loving me back. And that's okay. That's okay. It's not, it's not where the majority of my stuff was coming from, you know, my, Mm -hmm. my traffic. So yeah, I've tried to focus more on the actual blog. My goal is every week, but if you read my blog, you know, that's not happening. But uh, (laughs) yeah, I have other things going on. I mean, I am teaching online more and I've got a couple different conferences this summer. Plus, you know, I'm writing for a, a magazine also, too. And my kids are home from school. And so it's just it's just yes. mayhem. So but yeah, the blog needs to be my focus. And I got to get another book out. I'll just say it. That was one of my questions for you. I is is something on the horizon? Yeah, it well, I mean, that's the thing. Fight Right Book is basically it's my blog. All I got to do is go back to it's so why am I not I have no I have zero excuses because all (laughs) I need to do is go to my blog and look to see which articles are getting the most hits. I'm like oh that's what people need to know. Boom there's a chapter. Okay that's what people know. You know and in my fight right book it is taken from the blog it's just expanded upon. Not all of it's from the blog. There's some that's you know it's peculiar to the book. But um, that it's basically out there for me. I just got to sit down and do it. So okay, and you will. So yeah, I no will. There. I will. <laughs> Very. I've kind of and and another thing too is I train, and that's part of my job. And, and I tell people I'm not just going to the gym to feel good. I am feeling good. Don't get me wrong. But this this is part of my work is doing fight stuff. And sometimes I have so much fun training that I get home and I'm just like, oh, I need to write something. So I need to, I'm a morning writer, so I really do need to get up early and just get to it. Oh, the sun is my enemy. I, you're talking about training. And so uh, you nodded earlier when I mentioned nine different fights. Nine or ten. I forget. I count every time and I forget something. It's nine or ten. How long have you been training? I mean, that's phenomenal. ten years. Phenomenal. Ten years? about ten years. Yeah, I came to my powers late in life. So I haven't been training like a, a buku a time. But it started out in Hapkido-based self-defense. Hapkido is a Korean martial art. And from there, it went to MMA training. I was was like, what the heck? I'll just jump right in. And MMA training, mixed martial arts, it is a mixture of martial arts. And so I got a really good taste of a lot of different things. It was like a buffet. And I could go around and say, ooh, I I really like this. And I don't, you know, yeah, I like this. And so it just kind of drove me down the path. And it was one thing, it's an, you know, it's an obsession. I'll just say it's one thing after another. And, you know, every now and then I'll look and like two couple summers ago, I looked and saw a Groupon for Aikido and I thought, I'll do that. Sure. And I got my daughter and I'm like, we're going to do Aikido for a little while. She's like, okay. So we did that for a while. So, um, okay. So if I go through the timeline, let me think. So it started half keto and then MMA. And then I switched off and did specifically Taekwondo of its own, uh, Muay Thai style kickboxing and then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then... From there, I also did Filipino martial arts, which is edged weapon martial arts. Mm. And then I had a coach who taught me street defense. That is self-defense with guns and knives. And he also was a like a fourth or fifth degree black belt in kung fu. So I know kind of fu. I don't know kung fu. I just know kind of <laughs> fu. I would love to get to, uh, and, and that is something I've looked into going back to kung fu a little bit, but the classes were just too late. Okay, so I'm getting off topic. So then I did Filipino martial arts, and then I have done Aikido, Judo, 
and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, has mainly been my passion. That I love judo and I'd like to get back to judo. It's just, it's tough on my body. I had a, a back injury and I have a piece of metal in my back. And so, yeah, the metal doesn't care for me getting slung around so much. It's not hitting the mat. It's not the throw. It's when people sling me to the side or something. So I think that I covered every, I think that's everything I've done. I think, yeah, I think that's it. Which is beautiful to me. I think there's so many people who come up and offer advice on how to do something. And the experience and background you have an understanding of it, you were someone people should listen to. And the way that you teach things really has hit for me and it's made me step back and look at my Good. fight scenes. It's fantastic. So I'm Good. really excited to actually expand on that tonight and kind of talk a little bit more about specifically writing fight scenes. Okay. But I did want to say real quick, I don't know if anyone caught, Carla mentioned earlier her powers came later in life. If you want the full story on that, please, please go to her website. She has this <laughs> hilarious bio. It's a short story. She has a short story for a bio about how she is the long lost sister of Clark from Kansas. Well, so I mean, it's, it's a- it's a real thing. So good. <laughs> it's a real thing. Do you know somebody reached out to me one time and they said, and it, it was a fellow writer who was way above my pay grade, and they said, oh my gosh, your bio is on some writer's forum. And I, I went, why? And they were like, they were talking about how to write a funny bio. And I'm like, it's is so it good. funny? And they're like, yeah, it's funny. I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. So. <laughs> I was cracking up yeah. and I felt like I learned so much about you through it. And it wasn't like just listing things and I wasn't yeah. bored. I was like yeah. cackling as I was going through it. I'm like, okay, this is awesome. If you're going to be a nonfiction writer, because I, I love reading nonfiction and I don't know why I pushed back against writing nonfiction for so long. Yeah, I do. Because my dad was a fiction writer and then I have an aunt who was a poet so I was around so much fiction but my dad was also a technical writer and a nonfiction writer but you know I just had this dream of being a fiction writer you know it just seems so I don't know fancy and, and well to do and then you know people always say oh write what you read and I read so much nonfiction but here's the key I have my fiction heroes and I have my nonfiction heroes and one of my nonfiction heroes is John Krakauer and he wrote uh, Into the Wild under the banner of heaven, out on the edge, I think. And it reads like fiction. So when you're writing nonfiction, it does not have to be dry. You can add fun stuff in there. You're not changing the truth. You're just making it more enjoyable. And you have to think, you know, when you're telling somebody a story, you don't say, and then I did this, and then I did this. You know, you say, oh, we went to the store. You will not believe the traffic. I mean, that's the kind of, when you're writing nonfiction, go ahead and write it like you would say it. So make your nonfiction fun. It doesn't have to be dry. Promise. Okay, so I have to know, though. So you really did have a twin brother named Clark? No. Oh, okay. I was like, (laughs) I completely took that as Clark Kent and Superman. I must have been way off, but I, okay, I'm on the right page. I'm not that far off. I feel better. Yes, you are. As far as you know. Correct. Yeah, right. (laughs) As far as you know. Yeah, but I didn't start martial arts till. Okay, go ahead and get your math calculators out, okay? <laughs> I started martial arts when I was 38. So, yes, I'm 48 years old, and it is never too late to do martial arts, period. And I'm not one of those people that's like, martial arts is for everybody. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. It's for everybody for a couple months. <laughs> And, and then, then after that, they're like, yeah, this is That sounds funny. about right. <laughs> and not every martial art is suitable for everybody. So, I mean, I can say as an older person that they are, like, judo, for example, is tougher on my body. And so I have to be a little bit more careful with the things I do. But, yeah, I started late. And I have to say, I, it's one of the best things I ever, ever did for my own self, hands down. That's awesome. That's great. I mean, it led to a career path for Pete's sake. Yes, yeah, it did. Absolutely. I started doing, the reason I took self-defense in the first place was because I was writing a fight scene and didn't know how to fight. <gasps> really? So, full circle. Yes. Yeah. I like that. I was writing a book that I'll get back to one day. Okay. Stop. Let's just, <laughs> set, let's just settle down. Let's all just settle down. I'm going to start emailing you about this book. Yeah, I know. Let's just all take a beat. Okay, let's all just take, let's all take a breath. I went to a, it was the first writer's conference I had ever been to, and I had made appointments with professionals. You know, you can, uh, for those of you who've never been to a writer's conference, first of all, get your butt to a writer's conference. Number two, be with your people. It's like being on your home planet. You know, get back to your home planet. So um, a lot of times you can make one-on-one appointments with agents and editors. And the conference that I went to said one appointment with an agent, two appointments, that's it. And I'm like, okay, well, I can do that. Well, I was sitting and waiting for my appointment. This is a lesson for you kids. Listen up, okay? I was standing at the table waiting for my 
my turn and uh, people kept canceling their appointments. It conflicted with different things and that happens all the time. Like, you know, they have an appointment with something else. And anyway, people kept canceling appointments. And I asked the man who was doing the appointments, I was like, well, what happens to that spot? He goes, it's open. And I was like, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, that means the agent doesn't have a person. And I said, can I be that person? And he goes, yeah. I said, I have two appointments. He goes, like, sure, I don't care. And then another one came open and I said, well, who has that appointment? And I ended up with like six or seven appointments. Oh and he gosh. said, well, what do you write? And I said, well, generally I write speculative fiction. He goes, this is a romance person. I said, so? I can pitch it. You know, they can they can give me help on pitching. And so then one came open and I said, uh, and I, w- I didn't say anything because at this point I felt bad because I was hounding the guy. And he goes, you want this one? And I said, <laughs> uh, I don't know. And I looked down at it and I said, who's Steve Laub? He goes, um, that's Steve Lobby. And I said, okay. He goes, you don't know who that is? And I went, no. And he just wrote my name in. Okay. For those of you who don't know, Steve Lobby is a writing agent. He owns his own writer's agency called, wait for it, the Steve Lobby Agency. <laughs> he, uh, he's amazing. And so I was at one appointment and the man was looking at my work and he was just in a bad mood. And he was like, this isn't good. And at some point we kind of got into it and to where we were like both standing up. And he was telling me nobody was ever going to read my work. And I was oh, like, wow. well, hide and watch. I was like, they are. I said, how dare you? Anyway, so there's this older man who's at a table next to me that keeps, you know, give us the wide eye, side eye. Dang it, if it wasn't Steve Lobby. I'm like, great. (laughs) I've made an awesome impression. And so I sat down with him and he kind of did the, he did the Spock live long and prosper. And I said, oh, I said, do you know where that comes from? He goes, no. And I was like, it actually is because Leonard Nimoy is Jewish and that goes back to the Jewish blessing. And he was like, oh. And so I didn't we, know that. Yeah, yeah. There I'm is a, a super a, trucky fan and I didn't know that. Yes, yes, yes. So there is a Jewish prayer that talks about God looking out through the window shades at his beloved, which is us. And they make this, this kind of posture with their hands that imitates God looking through the blinds. It's very sweet. And that's where Leonard Nimoy got that. He came up with that on his own. So Steve read my stuff and he got back to me. He he said, this book isn't for me, but I like you. And I said, okay, well, that's fine because so-and-so wants to read it. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, then I want to read it too. And I was like, okay. And so I sent it to him. And it didn't work for him at the time. But we kept up with each other through the years. We would run into each other. And I'm like, when are you going to sign me? He's like, oh, when are you going to have something for me? And I said, that's really judgmental. I think you should just go ahead and sign me anyway. I said, you need to hit your wagon to this because I'm a cash cow. And he goes, well, start cashing, cow. And so um, long story short, he's my agent. Now he's my agent. Yeah, he's my agent for the Fight Right book. And uh, actually, he turned it down personally because he also had has a small publishing house he's like it's just not okay for us and I said well I think I'm gonna send it to Writer's Digest and he laughed he goes you got some chutzpah I was like mm, was that ever a question he's like no and so um I said well I sent it and he goes okay he goes we'll just settle down you know it's gonna be about six weeks before they get back to you six days six days wow. and I called him and I said would you be interested in representing a Writer's Digest author he goes maybe who would it be and I went mm, I know somebody so the guy that I I first talked to about a book that is the reason I started martial arts is now my agent about my book about writing fight scenes. Oh, so, that's fantastic. That's awesome. lovely. That's a lovely little circle. Circle of life. Yes, don't give up. And Writer's Digest turned me down, actually. I had a friend who wrote for Writer's Digest, and he gave me like an in. And so I sent a synopsis to the guy and uh, to the editor, and he sent it back. And he said that he had done the comps, and there just wasn't room for it. Comps meaning he was comparing it to other books in the same genre. Well, that was bull. Because I had done comps. I had been out looking for books about fight scenes. And so I sent him an email back and I said, you know what? Reserve judgment. When I finish, I'll send it to you with some donuts. I never heard from him again. (laughs) Oh. So I finished the book. So he was like, we're not. No, I may have. But it was very much, look, we're not interested. And I was just like, well, just uh, don't say anything yet. Okay. So I finished the book and I sent it in to the same guy. And I got a kickback email that said he was no longer with the company. But here's oh. another email. Send your to this person. And so I sent this person an email and I said that I had been talking to the previous editor about the book. Not a lie. We had been talking about it. He just turned it down. <laughs> and you just left that part out. Yeah, nice. I just, nice. you know, I had not lied. And uh, so, you know, she was very much interested. And, and the day I got the contract, 
I said, okay, I'm going to tell you something now. And she goes, this doesn't sound good. What are you telling me? <laughs> I said, so I said, first, let me ask, is this contract real? She goes, what do you mean? Is it real? I was like, is it done? Like, I'm for real. You're going to publish my book. She goes, yeah. I said, are you sure? She goes, yes. I said, I, I haven't sent it back to you. She goes, Carla, we're going to publish your book. And I say, okay, I have to tell you, I'll turn down my book. And she got so tickled. And she told everybody, they, they go through like a board of different editors on, on which books they're going to pick up. And they, they all kind of laughed and thought it was a funny story. So keep, That's awesome. Oh, yes. That's great. When, in, in the publishing world, no is a suggestion. So <laughs> you have to look at the reasons people are telling you no. And you have to think, okay, how can this make my work better? It's not about you. When somebody turns down your work, they're not turning you down. They're turning your work down, okay? The manner in which they do it, it also is not about you. It's about them, okay? If you have an agent or an editor that gets back to you and says, you are terrible. Nobody's going to read your work. That's not about you, even if your work is terrible. The, the way they chose to deliver that, that's about how they feel about themselves. So find people that will give you constructive criticism, not your family. Do not send your book to your family because they're either going to be too easy or too hard. They're not, they're going to be biased either way. They either love you or hate you. So uh, <laughs> there's no in between with family. There's no in between. No. There's not. You need to send it to somebody who's going to, you know, give you hard truth because that's what makes it better. It's like in jujitsu, somebody was, uh, a lady was talking to me today about, well, I don't know any submissions from these this different position and I said you know how to learn submission she goes how I said you get submitted you come in here you get your behind kicked that's yeah. how you learn and uh, so there's a lot of value in getting turned down is has value just don't take it to heart just make make yourself better that's a very positive way of looking at things because it is so easy to get down about it and blame it on yourself Absolutely. and blame it on your work right and that's a really positive wonderful spin to put on mm -hmm. it it's not you no I mean, it's technically not. it's them right you know I mean because the industry is the industry and right. they're going to take what they can do or what they feel they can do. And it doesn't mean stop. It just means right. that it's not right for whatever reason. Right. Anytime you have a creative endeavor, there's a piece of you in it. Yes. And so it's really hard when somebody says something negative about you and there's a, your blood's in that. Oh. So you just have to look at it as, okay, great. This is an opportunity for me to make this better. Or maybe this is an opportunity to abandon this project and get to the one you were meant to write from the start. You just have to take it in stride. That is something I have definitely learned from fight training. You're going to get hit. Ooh, and that's one of the reasons why boxing and Muay Thai made me so crazy because <laughs> getting hit in the face ticks me off so bad and it would send me into... I think it would make me cry. It makes oh, you angry. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it would send me into like a blind rage. rage. And then that then you're destroyed. Once you get angry like that, you don't, you, you don't think as clearly, you don't follow your game plan, you forget your technique. And I had a coach tell me, Carla, you got to love getting hit. And I said, well, that's never going to happen. He goes, well, then you better not do Muay Thai. And I'm like, well, that's your opinion. But, uh, <laughs> but you do. You have to say, okay, that, this is part of it. Muhammad Ali estimated in over the course of his career. You know, when you say Muhammad Ali, you, people think, oh, he's the greatest of all time. I mean, he is, hands down. He's the greatest of all time, followed closely by Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson mm -hmm. and Canelo, mm -hmm. but whatever. He was amazing. <laughs> and over the course of his career... He estimated he'd been hit in the head about 29,000 times. Oh, my gosh. And, oh my gosh. you know, after about 150 or 200, if he had just said, you know what, this is not for me. But he wasn't Muhammad Ali, despite the fact he'd been hit 29,000 times. That's why he was Muhammad Ali. Because he'd been hit that many times. And so you just have to take your licks and, and just keep on trucking. I like that comparison a lot. So much. Well, I mean, the fighting world, fighting and writing have so much in common. Because especially in something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a lot like wrestling. It's body-on-body -body contact. There's no strikes. It's all physics and it's not supposed to be muscle. But realistically, yeah, there's some muscle involved. It's physics and technique and everything. But you're face to face sweat to sweat with somebody and it's a very vulnerable process and I was talking to a lady about this today too she was having a hard time and she was saying I'm insecure and all that kind of stuff I'm like yeah that's jujitsu it's like the never-ending story when Atreyu has to walk to the to the southern oracle 
And he has to go through these different gates. And one of them is he has to look at a mirror image of himself, his true self. And so he's walking up to his reflection. And the, the walkway is just littered with bodies and empty suits of armor. And it was because those, all, those people died because they couldn't handle what they saw of themselves. And that's what I told her. I was like, in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the only thing that's on the mat is truth. If you're insecure, it's about to come out. If you are nervous about people and be in your personal space, it's about to come out. If you're hesitant, boom. So anything that you have that's really eating you up, it'll come out while you're fighting because the fighting is nothing but truth. And you have to remember that sometimes God puts you, I didn't come up with this phrase. I think it's K. Arthur. God puts you in situations that bring the worst out in you because the worst needs to be brought out of you. I mean, otherwise you're just going to carry it around. So writing, if you're doing it right, you're going to wonder, oh, is this right? Uh, maybe is it, you know, because the more emotional you get about it sometimes, and I don't mean overboard, but that deep connection you have with it, it's because there's a little bit of yourself in it. And so that's a good thing. And if you get your feelings hurt by an editor, it's because you love what you do. And that's a good thing. So quit your whining. That's my feeling. <laughs> I <laughs> agree. Done. Shut up and write. I think we should uh, deliver out some hits to help people with that experience. Yes. And in order to deliver those hits, I have a question for you. Yes. As someone who edits fight scenes, who has read a lot, who teaches a lot about them, mm -hmm. what are some of the most common newbie mistakes you see in writing a fight scene? Writing too much. Writing way too much. I have, a, I have a blog post on this where I showed what a journalist wrote about the entire fight between Muhammad Ali and, oh my gosh, boxing people are going to kill me, uh, Frazier, Joe Frazier. It was the rumble in the jungle. It was the rumble in the jungle. This was the longest boxing match in history. They literally changed the time that people boxed after this and... I don't know how they survived it. But you read what the journalist wrote about it, and it wasn't round one, they did this. Round two, they did this. And then this. What they did is they highlighted the main points. Read summaries of different fights. Another really great resource are comic books. Go through and look at comic books and see what they're illustrating and what they're not. They cannot illustrate every single move in a fight. So what do you see? You see when Superman's fist hits the chin and you see that chin kick back. There's a reason why they show the face kicking back. It's because it's showing the reader how hard that punch is. So, and then you have the biff and the pow, and that's because you want to get people in on the sensory experience. So go through your fight and think, okay, if this had to be in a comic book panel, what would I keep in and what would I take out? And I know as writers, we want to keep everything in because everything is important. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it may be important to you, but it's really not important to your reader. I think what a reader wants to know more than anything is the effect the fight has on the characters. Honestly, because you have to remember that fighting is a language all its own sometimes when I teach I'll I'll start out teaching in a foreign language and people just kind of look at me and I'm like well do you understand what I'm saying and they're like no and I'm like why and they're like I don't speak whatever that is and it's I, I know a little bit of Portuguese and I speak Spanish and and I was like that's why don't you know it like oh, I don't ever I was like because no one ever taught you nobody expects you to know what you haven't been taught and fighting is its own language and if you haven't been taught that language you don't speak it so don't expect your reader to speak a language. If your reader has to be educated in something to get through your story, there's a problem. Because you're, you're leaving out a whole demographic of people. Even in the book, American Sniper, he has an entire chapter on guns. I mean, obviously that demographic is probably going to like guns. But if you don't, you can skip that chapter. And it has no bearing on the rest of the story. Oh, interesting. You have to remember that you have to dip out of the same bucket of knowledge as your reader. Your reader may not know jack about fighting. And you're not there to teach them how to fight. That's, that's not, you're not there to teach, you're there to reach. So let them know the implications of the fight. Let them know the sensory experience. Tell me the sounds. Tell me the smells. Tell me everything that's going on around you. And yeah, you'll have some dialogue. And that was something else I was asked one time, you know, why people put dialogue in fights. You don't, you can't really have a dialogue when you're fighting. Yes and no. It depends on how fast the fight is going. But, you know, here's the thing. The highest grossing movie genre is action adventure. And actually, you eat more during action adventure movies than any other genre. They literally have dieting tips for people before they go to action event to know what, what you're going to eat. You do because you eat more. 
I have a, I've I've that. written on that, and you get so engrossed in action adventure movies. Uh, John Wick, for example, which is perfect. I love that movie. All of them. All of them. <laughs> There's times that Keanu Reeves gets hits like three or four times by a car. Okay, that's not real. Well, it is for you, Keanu. It is. It's not real, but I don't remember anybody saying, that's it, I'm out, and walking out of the theater. Because you're invested at that point. So you can strain credulity a little bit. Don't feel like it has to be play by play. It doesn't have to be 100% authentic with the technique because people don't don't care. Even when jujitsu people are recapping matches for each other, we don't say, and then he transitioned here and transitioned here and da 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 we pick up the big points. So watch a fight. If you have a hard time watching fights, boxing's a little bit easier to watch sometimes than MMA and kickboxing. And just say, okay, now turn around and tell somebody about that. Well, what are you telling them? You know, you're not telling them every single thing. So I think the biggest rookie mistake, number one, is just writing too much about the fight, getting heavy into the technique, because that's really not what matters. And also taking the focus off the experience and putting it on the technique rather than the experience. When I compete and they say, well, what did you, oh, you know, I, I caught an arm bar. Oh, cool, cool. They don't, sometimes they do it. I mean, if they're really into it, like, well, how'd you set it up? You know, <laughs> but um, for the most part, it's like, oh, cool. You know, some win by arm bar. And that's, that's the end of it. So in summary, don't write so much. Keep the focus on implications of the fight keep the focus on the sensory experience. There is a technique I suggest that is actually for people with anxiety. It's a grounding technique. When you have anxiety and you're just overwhelmed in the moment, you stop and you think, okay, what are five things I see? What are four things I hear? What are three things I can touch? What are two things I can smell? And one thing I can taste. And what that does is it puts you in the moment and it takes you out of your you know, anxious loop you know, whatever thought process is driving you crazy. And I think that's really good in fight scenes too. Stop, before you go into your fight scene, just say, okay, let me go stand here. Let me go look around. What are five things I see? What are four things I hear? And you may not include all of that in the fight scene. And when I do fighting techniques uh, for writers live, I always say, I'm not showing you all this because you're going to include every tiny bit. I'm putting it in here for you. You need to be in that moment. You don't need to necessarily write all of it. But you need to, you know, look around and be, if you are not present in that scene, I don't, I don't know if you can really pull anybody else into it. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. I've done a lot of research. I tend to write darker fantasy and I obviously have fight scenes. And so I've mm -hmm. done a lot of research and there's a lot of information that's out everywhere. You'll see the same stuff over and over. One thing I have not seen anywhere else is when you talk about a comic book strip. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it compared, and I think it's absolutely beautiful, and I kind of wanted to dig into that a little bit okay. because I think it's perfect. But I'm also wondering if there are key points that need to make sure you have a box for that, a picture box. Like, are there staples to a fight scene where, you know, no matter what you're picking and you're picking the best things, mm -hmm. but can you frame these this comic book strip to almost kind of be like a bullet point of a fight? What's necessary in that? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Also, um... I love graphic novels. I love graphic novels, comic books. I love that sort of thing. And yeah, you look and you think, okay, what are the stages of this fight? Okay, you have, first you have the first contact. Okay, you have a beginning. Every fight's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And sometimes that's just one punch. <laughs> I mean, also fights don't last as long as people think they do. Fights on the street under a minute. I, I mean, that's just that's just how it goes. But yeah, you need to look at, okay, what are the major movements that my reader needs to understand? Main thing, every fight needs to be blocked around the intended injury. Hear me again. Before you go into a fight scene, you think, what injury do I want to happen? Even if it doesn't happen, because that is going to determine how people are moving. You're going to move differently if you want to punch somebody versus if you're going to kick them or sweep them or shoot them. So number one, know what your intended injury is so that you have an idea what the movement needs to be. Number two, is there an injury that really needs to take place because of what happens later in the book? 
do you need this person to have a bruise? You know, do they need to have a physical, a visible bruise? If they need to have a visible bruise, it's probably going to need to be the face. What injury are you going for? What injury has to happen? Because it has a bearing on the rest of the book. And then kind of sculpt it. That's, that's the bones. And then add the skin and all that on top of it. And it's the major mile markers as you get to that. And that's really hard. If you're not schooled in fighting, it's a little more difficult to imagine. But that's a good point because your reader's probably not schooled in fighting either. The majority of the population isn't. So I think you should focus on the large movements. And that's the same thing with graphic novels. Uh, They focus on the large movement unless the small movement changes the scene. I have a post too that has pictures from... The, the comic book, Old Man Logan. Wolverine. I love X-Men. They're my favorite. I think we might be soulmates, just so I you know. I love X-Men. Okay, <laughs> let's come back to that. because Star I have... Trek and X-Men? <laughs> yes, and the original Star Trek, Captain Kurt, was my first crush ever. And oh. I'm going to go off about the Avengers, okay? I, I don't like them. Let me go ahead and say I it. I don't Boom. Don't. I didn't finish them. like them. Not realistic, okay? Let's just stop here for a minute. I think we need to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would let the Avengers exist. Okay, one person is a superhero, two is a super duo, three skin to be a problem, four is a mob, five, if you have five people with special abilities, guess what? They're going to take over, and everybody knows that. X-Men is more realistic. Yeah, X-Men is real. Okay, so that's my feeling on that. (laughs) If you have a bunch of people with special abilities, they're going to be oppressed because people are going to be afraid of them. That's all there is to it. So anyway, Old Man Logan, I think I have some pictures of it. But it, it, I think there's a point where he does some small thing behind his back mate, but with a lock. Obviously, if they're doing something behind their back that's like letting them loose from handcuffs or something, that's pivotal to the scene. And I promise you, when I, when I teach about writing fight scenes, I can see people kind of getting overwhelmed. And I, I'm like, look, have you ever read the directions on tying your shoes? It's exhaustive and it's confusing. But you get to where you're just like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And the more you do it, you know, the, the, the more flow you'll have to it. So number number one, I'm holding up two fingers. For those of you who can't see me, I was like, number one, I held up two fingers. <laughs> number one. We weren't going to tell on you. Yeah, good. It's true. <laughs> N- number one, what's your intended injury? You don't have to accomplish it. Number two, what injury absolutely does have to happen? Three, what are the major movements? Big movements. Don't include movements that people might have a hard time understanding, even if it's cool. I'm sorry. Something being cool is not a reason for it to be in the scene. That's, I mean, it's, it's an awesome reason, but it's not the best reason. Because if it inhibits understanding, if at any point your reader has to go, wait, what? Boom. You may have lost them. I think 50 pages. I think it takes 50, that's what, when you send your uh, work in to an agent or editor, they, they generally ask for 50 pages. Because if you don't have them in that time, you don't have them. It can take 50 pages to, to get a reader, but it can take a page to lose them. And you just don't want to take that, that risk. So find the major movements in the scene, what's pivotal to the scene. And then everything else, just say, okay, what's happening around these people? Now, I caution you, if the scene is in first person... It cannot be emotional because when you start fighting, adrenaline takes over. And one of the functions of adrenaline is to dull your emotions. And there is a reason for that. When you're being chased by a bear, you don't need to sit and contemplate the emotional implications and your place in the universe with this bear. You need to run. You also aren't really good at critical thinking and problem solving. That is why people spar. You do not spar to learn. You spar to practice using what you already know under the effects of adrenaline. So when you have people fighting, if you say, oh, he was terror, you know, with terror, he struck the other person. You know what? There may be some rando out there who actually feels fear while they're fighting, but it's contrary to the function of adrenaline. And I've been, you know, I've competed enough now that you go into a very blank place. There's, there's a book called The Book of Five Rings. And it is, uh, it was written by a, a sword master and it was kind of a guide to teaching younger swordsmen. And the very last chapter, so he teaches you all this, all this, and then the very last step to becoming a master is called the void. And the void is where you go back to knowing nothing. In other words, you don't think, it just happens. There's no emotion, 
there's nothing else except you and what your brain already knows to do. And when you're fighting, you kind of go into that void. If you're a trained fighter, you definitely go into that void. It's, it's all muscle memory. If you're in a fight or flight situation for real, there's not a lot of thinking that goes on. I also wrote a post on, I used to train with a lady that was attacked by six people. Six people descended upon her. And she was, she, she said, no, I wasn't afraid. She goes, my thoughts were protect my head, protect my organs, grab her hair. You know, things like this. I mean, the woman walked away with stomp injuries. She had boot prints on her side. Wow. And the whole time she was just thinking, survive, survive. It's a very primitive thought process. Okay, here's a prime example of where there's just not emotion involved. I was in a competition and you compete in different weight classes. The thing is, you want to be at the top of your weight class. Okay, you don't want to be at the bottom. You just want to be at the top. Even though it's only like 10 or 15 pounds, it's that tiny bit of an advantage. Well, my weight class is my walking around weight. Well, the problem is I have to wear a gi and that's four pounds. Three, three point something. But I estimate four pounds. So I needed to lose four pounds to get into that gi. Fine. Wouldn't you know it? Dang it. Day of, I'm like, oh my gosh. I was like, I don't know how many ounces over. And so I had to take off my rash guard, which is what you normally wear under the gi. And so I, I just had a sports bra, which is legal, but it's super uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with that. And I have this little pair of shorts on underneath my pants in case my pants got pulled off. Oh, but I was just like, oh my gosh, the sports bra. Why? Okay. Well, I didn't even tighten the straps. Okay, so it, it wasn't, I, look, people, if you've never met me, I wear a sports bra because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's just all, that's just all there is to it. Okay, there's not so much necessity. It's just adhering to society's rules. And I'm thankful because I had to take off my rash guard. And so my gi gets pulled open, and which is fine. And God bless the girl. I know this opponent. I have a great respect for her. She was not doing this on purpose. If she did not reach and pull that bra down. And I no. looked... <laughs> I looked down oh, at myself no. and I looked up at all the people standing <laughs> at the fence, standing. Now, well, I, I was not completely exposed at this point, but I looked at the people at the fence and my only thought was, this is how it happens. <laughs> and I was like, this is how it happens. Keep going. So, you know, in a normal state, I would have been, what? And lose my mind. But you're so void. You're so much in the void mm -hmm. that it's very a non-emotional. Like, okay, these people are, are about to see me nude from the waist up. And guess what? I don't care. That's just how it is. And um, when I win, then I'll have a funny story to tell. So <laughs> that's my funny story to tell. So it's take, a good one. Yeah, you have to take, if it's a first person thing, you can take emotion out of it. If it's, you know, third person, you can describe obviously the faces and you will see grimaces and all that. Um, very trained fighters have a very blank expression. They do. Because it, it helps with your emotions and it helps keep you calm. And it also helps with breathing. Yeah, those are just the hundred things to remember what I just said. <laughs> okay. They're good things. Okay, good. Really good things, good. yes. So those are like the meat and bones. And you talked to it a little bit, you said, then you come back and fill in the skin. Mm -hmm. And I I was curious for you, I you went into it a little bit with first person, how there's not emotion. So in general, from like third person or omni, how much percentage do you feel should be internal? How much percentage should be outer dialogue? And how much percentage should be actual action in a fight scene? I think a lot depends on the writer's voice. It does. Some people are really good about getting internal. Chuck Palahniuk, the writer of Fight Club, he's brilliant at this. I mean, his first person, he, he talks through things very much first person. And actually, the book Fight Club... If you've never read Chuck Palahniuk, he's gritty. He's very raw and very gritty. The book Fight Club is not about fighting. It's really not. There's very few fight scenes in it. And the ones that are in it are very, very short. And the guy, it's the narrator, who is never named, by the way. The narrator, I love that about Chuck Palahniuk. Narrator's never named. And he'll just say things like, fight number two, the guy grabs my head like a football and rams it into the wall. And that's it. That's it. And then he'll very, and that's from a first person, very matter of fact, he'll talk about, I, you know, bite through my cheek. But that's his writing voice. You know, jump over to Orson Scott Card and Ready Player One. Yeah, that's the name of it, right? Ready Player One? Yeah. Yes. And he's way more into action. He writes a lot of action. And he'll take breaks every now and then to kind of pop into, and that's something else. The timeline of your fight doesn't have to be real. 
It doesn't. Because if that's the case, then the whole thing needs to be over pretty darn fast. You can step out of the action and go inside the person's head for just a second. You know, there may be something that happens that completely, rem you know, reminds them of a traumatic event. That's okay. They do that in movies all the time. John Wick. You're watching John Wick and boom, you get a flashback of his wife. And this is in a moment where he's gotten out of a terrible car chase. All he know, you know is he wants this car so bad. He gets hit. He gets beat up. He wants this car. And you're like, oh, he loves this car. And he gets out and he opens the glove box and he pulls out a picture of his wife. And you realize that's why he wanted that car. And then you go in through this whole, it steps away from the actual timeline and you remember things about his wife watch movies for pete's sake take some cues from movies so you have somebody like orson scott card that's super heavy into action and then you have somebody like tolkien i always read him with a little bit of sarcasm he's got that that just that kind of dry wit his is totally different. His fight scenes seem very much told from a person floating above it. You'll see uh, somebody turn around and the goblin horde came toward us and hid behind a log. And so you know what this person, it's more in their head. Tolkien will show some of the, the major things. So that's that's very three different styles. You have a first person, of, and I, I have a, a post on that too. I, um, Chuck Palahniuk, who's very much first person. But because it's first person and the guy's involved with a fight, it's very short choppy thoughts because that's how you think okay you jump over to orson scott card he's very much third person he tells way more of the action but if i remember correctly he uses a lot of great action words use your action words as your adjectives okay he didn't walk across the room with attitude he sashayed you know, you make <laughs> the most of the words you have and he if i remember he uses i don't know slip smack words that tell you more than just the action well then you have somebody like tolkien who just you know omnipresent floats above it all and tells from one person's perspective in kind of a tongue-in-cheek kind of way so i think a lot of that really has to do with your writer's voice and the way you figure out what your writer's voice is writing a lot a lot a lot a lot and you'll get to a point to where somebody can i mean i think at this point if you have a couple different writers in front of you and somebody who's familiar with my work I think they could pick it up and say oh I know who that is that's Carla because I have a very definite way that I write and that's because I've just been doing it for so dang long I've been writing for a long time people don't know that I've actually been writing for a long time so just write 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 until you get your voice down and you will find that your fight scene will have a different tempo that's peculiar to you so you mentioned you've been writing a long time how long is a long time oh my gosh professionally oh how old are my kids professionally only about 12 or thir professionally about 12 or 13 years but I started uh writing for a local magazine way you know like 12 years ago and I was kind of their color writer and then I became their ghost writer and then I became their editor so I, I've been doing that but I mean I grew up with a writer I mean, my dad was a writer. I'm a lifelong writer. I have, you know, writing portfolios from high school. And then you write. It's great to keep, especially write things out by hand. I know it's crazy in this day and time where we just, it, I personally write so much faster and I've gotten to where I think so much better on a keyboard. But every now and then write things out by hand because, uh, you know, one day you're going to pick it up and you're going to look and think, oh, I touched this. So lifelong writer, but writing professionally. Uh, for about 12 years. And I've written a lot of different stuff. I've, I mean, I've written fiction. I've written a lot of nonfiction. I've written advertisements. I've done, oh gosh, I've done ghostwriting for, uh, for different people. And that's a tough one. Ghostwriting is a tough one. Why is that one tough? Because you're not writing in your voice. You're writing in theirs. I would have people like, um, they would want an advertisement. Okay, so let's say that they've bought a one-page spread in the catalog for the Houston Rodeo. And then I'm like, well, can you write this for me? I'm like, you know what? Why don't you write it no matter how bad it is and then give it to me because then I'll make it sound like you and some people don't want that some people are like no I don't want to sound like me I want to sound like you but I still make them write it anyway <laughs> because you learn more about what people want by what they write than what they just tell you yeah I've been writing a long time so you've been writing a long time I love the comic book but can you do you have any other advice tips for controlling pacing in a fight scene oh my gosh you know a lot of it depends on the energy of the fight why are they fighting there's three things you need to consider before you start writing a fight scene why where and who in that order 
A lot of times people think, oh, who's fighting? No, 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 no. Who is fighting is not nearly as important as why they're fighting. I may be in the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world, but if he's being paid to lose by the mob, guess what? I'm going to win because his why is money. So the why is what really matters. Where matters because a fight that takes place in an open meadow is going to be very different than a fight that takes place in a furniture store. You know, there's going to be a lot of things in the way. So you have to consider all of those things because, you know, if you're fighting when there's a lot of buffers around you, well, that's going to interrupt the fight a lot. So um, consider the why, the where, and the who. And in that why, you know, there's a difference in fighting to win a tournament and fighting to protect your child. If you fight against me in a tournament, life happens. You know, you're, you might beat me. If, if, you, if you try to get my kid, that's going to be a problem. You're going to know... You're going to remember me. You are going to remember me if you mess with my kid. And so I think the why behind it is going to uh, give energy to the scene. You have to remember, are they fighting for their life? If they're fighting for their life, that's going to be a very different fight. Then, um, you know, are they fighting? And, and, and is their fight going to be interrupted because the cops are coming? Well, that, that completely changes the pace of it because they may have just been shoving each other. But, oh, you know, the fuzz. And now they have to run. And so you need to look at the why, the where, and the who, and consider what does the pace of this scene need to be given the circumstances. I also wrote um, a post on Bob Rossing, your fight scene. And I think that's what people oh, want. And if you don't know who Bob Ross is, you're missing out. Number one, look up Bob, B-O-B-R-O-S. Yeah, He's a brilliant, brilliant painter. And what he does is he paints step by step by step. And you follow him and you do exactly what he did. So you can paint the same picture, which let me guarantee you will not look anything like his. <laughs> no, I've tried. <laughs> but yes, exactly. I have a friend who is an amazing artist featured in the Smithsonian. And he's like, let me tell you something about Bob Ross. He is, and he just had let out a string of cuss words. And he's like amazing <laughs> with a spatula. He's that amazing with the spatula, a paint spatula. It's crazy. It's crazy. But there's Close not there's not a formula because every fight scene is different. Every writer is different. The goal of every book is different. And so I think that's why some people, it, they get frustrated. Like, well, how do you write a fight scene? Write an article on that. And I'm like, okay, uh, and then I'm going to write how to live. I mean, you, ha it, it, you can't just write that. <laughs> just as easy. Yeah. How to dance. Um, what kind of dancer are you talking about? So it really is peculiar to the book and the writer's voice. And so that is why I don't say step one, do this. Step two, do this. Although I am working on a mapping, a kind of a mapping idea. I have gotten into metacog mapping. And that's where you, like if you have something that you're trying to just deal with, that's in the middle of the page. And then you have branches that come off of it. And it's like, what are your behaviors associated with this? What are your triggers associated with this? And, you know, when you're in high school, mapping is one of the things they teach you sometimes in English class. And when you write an essay, here's your main subject. And, and you know, all the little branches, all the things you can say about the subject. So I'm kind of working on something like that for my tactile people who love markers of every color like I do. So oh, We have a writer friend like that. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and so, you know, it will kind of help you put it on paper in front of you. Like, oh, okay, N now I see the way to go. But there's not one way to do it. There's not one way to do everything. You know, one of my jujitsu coaches was a fifth degree black belt, which something that's different about jujitsu than it is the other arts it is it takes much longer to get a black belt and there are specifications you have to remain at each belt for a certain amount of time you have to be a certain age to have different belts and so to have five stripes he had to have 20 years in as an active black belt not just jujitsu just as a black belt and he would teach things and he would say you know or it may not work and you're like okay thank you Thank you for saying that. He's like, oh, you know, if you got if you got the short leg like Carla, I'm like, yeah, you don't have to tell me I have short legs. <laughs> but the fact is, there's some techniques that don't work for me. I'm the size of a large fifth grade boy. There's some things that just don't work for me that are going to work with people who have long legs. And there's going to be some things that I can do that that super tall person with long legs can't do. So it's very much it de it's dependent upon you know you the writer i i don't think anything else is a substitute for good old-fashioned work just sitting out and doing it and i know people who heather birch uh is a writer that i she's one of the first writers i, I ever met she's really inspiring to me and, and her fight scene she said that she would set up stuffed animals in the room and so she could understand where the eyes were <laughs> You know, Ooh. and, and w okay, now oh. in the scene, where is my back? And when I do teach fighting techniques, 
one of the things I tell writers is I'm teaching you this so you understand how the body is oriented. Not because I expect you to write this. If you're going to write a fight scene that has a lot of movement, it behooves you to get up and do... I, no, you don't know how to do such and such kick. But you understand that when you kick your foot, you can't do something with the other foot. You know, <laughs> something's got to yeah, be planted. Yeah. If you punch with your left hand, you can't automatically do a spinning back kick with the left foot. Because that's where your balance is. So if you can, get up and kind of walk around and say, okay, where is my body oriented? You know, when you have blades, you have to think, how would I react if somebody, you know, tried to stab me here? When you learn Filipino martial arts, we would learn different knife patterns. And every pattern was even if you don't get that particular strike, it's going to open up another part of the body. So let's say that I want to get you in the neck but I can't, but you're guarding your neck. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stab at your stomach because it's a human impulse, impulse to lean forward. And then what do you do when you lean forward? You just stick your chin out because it helps keep your balance. Boom. Now I've got your neck. So you have to kind of stand up and say, okay, if somebody hit me on this side of my face, what would my head do? You know, how would, if you get hit in the front of your face, you're probably not going to fall forward. That's just a physics thing. So get up and walk around and, and, Kind of put yourself in that position and say, okay, how, how would my body be oriented in this? And you don't have to know how to do the moves. You don't have to know how to wield a katana. But you understand that when you take your arm across this way, well, then you can't suddenly change position. You, you know what I mean? You, you It's physics. For sure. You can't change physics. In your book, you can. <laughs> and that's something else. You need to establish what's normal. What is normalcy in your book? If everybody has superpowers then superpowers aren't super, they're normal. So you need to establish this, you know, this is a normal world, this is normal gravity, this is what their abilities are. So if you are going to break the rules of the normal world, your reader needs to understand why. So bear that in mind too. Just all that. That's all. And then it's easy. Yes, that's all. Just yeah, super and then easy. It's easy. Yeah. I did have one more question, and then I'm going to ask for some recommendations for resources and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I was curious, are there any tropes or stereotypes about fighting that a writer should avoid that oh my just drive you bonkers? Yes. And I did a video on these, and that was lies that writers should not believe. And watch me not be able to remember them. One, people aren't born knowing how to fight. It is a skill. Skill. You may be born with an ability, a natural ability, but nobody is born with skill. Skill is something you work for. So if you have a character that is working with a sword, they're not going to be, okay, the, the Karate Kid movie on Netflix, which I love because I'm an 80s gal. Those kids were black belts in a week. That's that's not how that works, you know. <laughs> um, so, I wish. Yeah, yeah, that's just not, you know what? I wish, but I don't wish. Because, man, you got to put the sweat in. Fair enough. Yeah, th that's one. Nobody's born with a skill. Number two, women don't fight different than men, y'all. Trained women do not fight differently than men. Now, I will say that I choose different techniques sometime than a man does. But it is not because I'm a woman. It's because of my size and because of the strength differential. So you may have a female samurai who is fighting with something other than a katana. What's the one? Oh, I can't believe I can't remember this. But it's, it's a long wooden staff and then it's got a blade on the end. Anyway, she didn't choose that. I'll think of it as soon as this interview's over. I know it, right? She didn't choose that because she's a woman. She chose it because she's short, you know, and because she, she doesn't have as much strength as somebody else. So I, I've had people say, okay, well, it's a girl, so how would she fight? And I'm like, um, like a guy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, when yes. um, I am paired up with um, male teammates who are on the smaller side, we're doing the same things because they're also small. And, you know, when my coach is rolling with a woman who is much, my coach is a, a pretty short guy and he's like 140 pounds. And if he's rolling with a woman who's 200 pounds, guess what? She's going to try to muscle him just like a man would. Not because she's trying to be like a man, but because she is using, she, she's, she's using what she already has naturally. Women don't fight different than men just because they're women, unless they're not trained. And then it is a little different. There are some little, a few different things that come into play and it has to do with society and all that kind of stuff, which you can learn about in my book. Okay, next thing. Still. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole chapter on it. 
Um, you cannot shove someone's nose into their brain with a punch and kill them. I cannot tell you how many times I have said I would strike their nose and shove it into their brain and kill them. Really, because then there would not be one living fighter in professional fighting. Okay. If you've ever seen a skull, do you see a big bony nose? Negatory. You don't because there's no bone. There's just a tiny little bit of bone. So that is something that's just, it's not a thing. Um, another thing, if you punch stuff with a bare hand, it's going to catch up with you. You're going to break something eventually. Fighters wear protection on their hands for their own hands, not the opponent. They could care less if they're hurting the opponent. It's to protect their hands. And underneath that glove is gauze. And the gauze pulls all the bones of the hand together tightly. So the force of the punch is dispersed over all the bones rather than taken by one or two, which can lead to a boxer's break. Now, if you have a scrappy fighter who's been doing bare knuckle fighting, and there is bare knuckle fighting leagues um, for a while, they will not break their hands as much because, and if you've seen their hands, you know why. They're massive. They have calcifications on it. And there's actually exercises, um, striking exercises you do to build up those bones. But yeah, if you just go around bare knuckle fighting, it's going to catch up with you. You're going to break something. Another one, when people are fighting in a group, they don't take, they don't take turns. I just wrote something about that for Writer's Digest. And I'm like, they don't take a number and wait like they're at a deli. Okay. <laughs> they're all going to come down on you at the same time. And yeah, in the process, they may hit each other. That's part of it. Can't think of anything else that just drives me absolutely bananas. Oh, yeah. Guns run out of ammo. I don't know if people are aware of that. But the bullets <laughs> aren't everlasting. It's not a Willy Wonka <laughs> everlasting gobstopper situation. You're going to have to read. But I want that gun now. Oh, I do. Um, I want that. You Or you can do is, um, I think it's called uh, New York Reload. And that's where you just toss that gun and pick up another one. That That's one way to go about it. That's the John Wick thing. He's a New York Reload. He runs out of bullets. Boom. He throws away. He gets the next one. <laughs> By the way, the fighting in John Wick is impeccable. He was uh, trained by a man who I've interviewed. His name is Hegan Machado. And the things you see Keanu Reeves doing, he's doing. And he was trained in uh, jujitsu. He was trained in judo. He was trained in shooting. He was trained all of these things. So those are, if you have an issue with violence, those are tough movies to watch. But if you're looking for a really good reference, yeah, his blade work is amazing. Uh, those movies are a great reference. So I think that's, I can't think of anything else like right off the top of my head. They were No, those were great. great. Okay, good. And I like the John Wick's reference. Are there any other resources, books, blogs, websites? Obviously, they need yes. to check out your stuff. Mm -hmm. What else would you recommend if someone's trying to hmm. really do this right? Other than my book book which is hard for me to say I've been told I have to say that my book is my favorite book. and it is my book is my favorite book well if it makes you feel any better you are my favorite material I have ever oh, found for writing you. fight scenes thank you so there's a favorite for you <laughs> as far as writing fight scenes I can't think of another book there I didn't go into guns a lot in my book and that's something that people complained about and the fact is there are entire books written on guns and I'm not going to compete with that so if you have a police officer, if you have a military person, I highly suggest you read a book like that, for, like American Sniper. Read books that have great fight scenes. Oh, great references for fight scenes. Fight Club, Chuck Palahniuk. Unbelievable. That is one of my go-tos. But now I love his writing voice, and his writing voice is the voice I would like to have. But it depends. If you're a fantasy writer then read some fantasy books that have fight scenes and look at your genre and then look at what they're doing. And and you may read it and think, yeah, that's not how I want to be. Well, that's great. Part of being who you want to be is knowing who you don't want to be. So as far as technical stuff, watching fights if you can, watching sword fights if you can, watching knife, I mean sword fights, you know what I mean, like in movies. I don't mean the real thing. Um, also... <laughs> If you name a martial art in your work, you better consider it a character. You better know it. If you say that your character does judo, guess what? You better know a little something about judo. That's not one of those things. Like, I, I'm, I'm ever amazed at people who sit down with me and, like, they're like, oh, 50% of my book is fighting. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What, you know, what fight training do you have? None. Well, that's a problem. You know, you wouldn't write a book about complicated brain surgery. We would not do that. Now, we might write a scene 
and we might, you know, watch a surgery on YouTube or whatever, but it's not going to take up the bulk of the book. Again, I speak a little bit of Portuguese, but I'm not able, I'm not capable of writing a book in Portuguese. So why would I even go in that direction? If a martial art plays a major role in your scene, I highly suggest you go to a gym, a martial arts gym. You don't have to necessarily be able to do it because I am not one of those people like, oh, everybody can do martial art. Like I said, no, some people's bodies are not made for certain things. People have injuries. People are different. Um, for the, uh, in the example of judo, if you have judo in your work, you need to go to a judo gym because you need to know the sound of that body hitting the floor. You need to know the speed of it. You need to know the sounds people make when they throw other people. If you have boxing in your work, if you have any type of organized fight scene like boxing or MMA in your book, don't you dare write it <laughs> without going to a fight because you need to know what the room feels like and what it smells like. Because there's fights have smells. Because it's just the hormones fill the air. And you don't realize it while you're in it. Like you're in, in the arena the whole time. Now if it's a massive arena, you may not notice it. But if it's a small venue, you know, you're sitting and watching it. You've been there for a couple hours. You step out, get something to drink. You walk back in. You're just like, wow, I didn't smell that before. There's smells, there's sounds. If possible, go to the, the site of it whenever you can. Something else I, I meant to mention this earlier. Something I think, and I implore people to do this. Take your reader off the couch and put them in the arena. And here's why. We can watch Hamilton. A lot of people watched Hamilton on TV. Okay? And when you watched Hamilton on your couch, you had a better, better view of Hamilton than Hamilton did. You're seeing it better than anybody in that room. You're seeing it better than the actors. So why the heck would anybody buy a ticket and go to a theater to see Hamilton live? Because what you can't see in the actual theater, you feel. And it's a sensory experience. And so when you, it's like a live sporting event. Yeah, if you watch football, you're going to get a way better view of the football game on your couch. But the stands are full because those people want to feel it. So you need to get your reader off the couch where they have that just visual 2D kind of experience. You need to make it 4D. You need to let them get all their senses involved in it whenever possible. Get them off the couch and get them in the arena. And yes, again, if a martial art plays a pivotal role in your work, it might be good to have some experience in it. Even if you can't do it, you need to see it firsthand. You know, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes YouTube's all you got. Whenever possible, go and see it in person. I mean, if nothing else, look at look at people's faces. That's important. Looking at people's faces and, and listening to the crowd and watching what happens when the body hits the mat. You know, the way the body kind of bounces when it hits. And you'll know if they're unconscious when they hit the mat by the way their body kind of, if they kind of ragdoll when they hit the mat, then you know they were unconscious when they hit it. Even if they come to after. So... I mean, it's all those little nuances. Whenever you can, just get there in person. That's my advice. That's, that's fantastic all. advice. I, that makes, no, that's fantastic That's really advice. good for, I, really I mean, like that's, that's general writing advice, too. The idea is to get the reader completely immersed into a scene and actually there. That is wonderful advice to go out and actually be able to do these things and and to smell it and yeah. see it and feel it. Yeah, you want your reader ticked at you sometimes. Yeah. You want your reader to go, what? <laughs> right? No. You, I, I will never forget, I read the book. Gone Girl, which that is a perfect example of breaking the rules. Everybody says, oh, you should, you should show, not tell. Okay, well, then here you have a bestseller where a lot of it is told through a diary. And so she's literally telling you the story. She's breaking, Jillian Flynn broke all the rules. And so I think the number one rule of writing is keep your reader in the moment. Oh my gosh, I may have a spoiler. I don't want to spoil it. Anybody hadn't read it. But there is one moment where everything takes a twist. And I sat up on the couch and I went, are you kidding me? <laughs> and my husband's like, what? And I went, nothing. Just don't judge me. Never mind. But yeah, that's what you want. You want your reader to get upset when somebody gets killed. That's another thing. Have the guts to kill important people. That's one of the things I love about The Walking Dead. Dear heavens, everybody's up for killing on The Walking Dead. So, I don't know. That's just it. But that, you know, I digress easily. I digress easily. Good digression. I like it. So, I did want to ask you, as we're concluding here, mm -hmm. if you have a favorite metaphor, even one that's your own writing or someone, something you've heard, but your favorite metaphor for a fight scene. Get your reader off the couch. Get them in the arena. 
That's my okay. number that one a, thing. It's a good one. That's the number one thing. Make it an experience. They're, I mean, they're not just reading it. Put them in the fight. Put them next to the ring. Let some of that stink hit them in the face. You know, if you are <laughs> close enough, if you're close enough to the ring, you'll get sweat on you. You'll get blood on you. You can be vomited on. I saw that in a fight. God bless that girl. Oh. But that's what you want. You know, and when something else hit them in their sensory organs. I, I, I tell somebody, I have pictures of me. I don't know how many black eyes I've had pictures, black eye pictures I have. But I, when I teach, I'll show a picture of me with a black eye. And people are like, ah, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I got need in the face. And everybody goes, ooh, <laughs> that's a very different thing. You know, if you just say they got hit, that's one thing. But if you say they got need in the face, that's a very different visceral experience. And, you know, hit your reader with what they know. Not every reader understands what it's like to be punched in the eye. But they understand that when you get something in your eye, both your eyes water. And your whole body pays attention. And then you can't see. And then you start sniffling. Your nose gets snotty. And it's like your whole body pays attention when something gets in your eye. And so, you know, look at look at common things like that. Wh- where can you connect with your reader? Fantastic. That's great advice. All right. We are going to make sure we put up all the information because Carla's, uh, everything she said here and then more is in her YouTube channel, in her book, in her classes you can take. It's fantastic. There's something for everyone. Make sure to check it out. Mm-hmm. And thank you so much, Carla. We really appreciate it. Yeah. If you want me to talk to your book club via Zoom or anything, I'm I'm happy to do that. I'm, I'm fairly easygoing. Fantastic. I'm not terribly That's demanding. Awesome. I appreciate it so much. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to put a fight scene into my rom-com series now that's that's gonna have to happen at some point oh absolutely <laughs> something's gonna have to happen no, there that makes sense <laughs> that makes sense because where there's romance there's tension i'm like okay i think i can squeeze this into book four i know i'm, I'm just already getting little threads out it's great <laughs> helen of troy okay that's a romance that i mean a, a whole thing came out of that romance yes. right there so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah some of the oh, worst wars have battle. been fought yes, out of love absolutely so. yes it's gonna be good goes back to the why yeah and then it's like when i talk about my book a lot of people think well i don't write action i don't write mystery i'm like what do you write i write amish and i'm like oh is there any conflict in your book well yeah i'm like there you go because so my book if you haven't seen my uh checked out my book it's not just about punching and kicking it also talks about the biology of fighting and what happens, you know, what are what is the function of adrenaline? How does adrenaline affect your body? But I talk about manipulation. I also teach self-defense. And so I talk about the kind of things that predatory people do. And if your villain is a predatory person, you need to know what their body language is going to be like. You need to know what gaslighting mm-hmm. is, you know, and I have a whole chapter on gaslighting. So um, also there's a section on injuries, And so it's not just about punching and kicking. And that is something that people tend to be confused about. So there's not a genre that can't pull something out of it. Yeah, if you write an Amish romance, that's fine. Does any character get hurt at any point? Well, yes, you know, Jedediah cuts his hand off with an axe. Great, you need need my book. (laughs) Because let me show you what the stages of bleeding out look like. Let me show you what stages of decomposition look like. So there's a, a little something for everybody that in it. That is wonderful. And you know what? Perfect. I do have some nonfiction books I can recommend. One of them is The Gift of Fear. Honestly, if you're going to read one book, don't read mine. Read The Gift of Fear because it talks about the importance of fear and what happens in your body when you are afraid of stuff and, and why you should be afraid of, of certain things and what predators do. The Gift of Fear is a really important book. The Art of War is another really important book and not because it's super interesting because The Art of War is not super interesting. The book is a th- over a thousand years old at this point and it's still, the strategies are still used today. And it's because even though we're using different weaponry, even though we have different battle strategies, the reason that book is still relevant is because it's a about human nature more than anything you know it, it says that if your soldiers trust you like sons they will walk into the deepest valley with you and a valley is not a great place to fight it's not not super great and so it talks about the kind of connection you need to have with your warriors and the importance of trust and battle there's another one that i bring up all the time to a surrounded enemy leave a way of escape And remember that when you're in a conflict with somebody, don't box them in. Because when you box somebody in, they're going to become a different person. Give them a way of escape. When a warrior has a way of escape, he's fighting for his family, for his country. If you take off that escape, now they're fighting for their life. And that's a whole different thing. So the gift of fear and the art of war and my book, 
And just book about writing in general is Chuck Palahniuk's writing book. He has an amazing writing book. Fantastic. So, Thank you. All. Very, very helpful. Check that out. All right. Thanks, Carla. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. And if you liked this episode, please subscribe and give us that clickable five-star love. Got writer questions or feedback? Reach out through our website. And until next time, make sure to punch the keys.